Uh, my name is Ahmed Abu Zaid, and our uh, next speaker needs no introduction. Uh, her name is Manal Rustum, and she's probably one of the few people on earth to ever get a major campaign wearing a hijab. Uh, her name is Manal Rustum, and um, I'm personally a huge fan of hers. Hi, Manal. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Great. I've never done one of these virtual uh, speaking events, by the way, so it's kind of awkward for me, this you know? It's supposed to be an intimate fireside, fireside kind of thing, but I can't even see. It's a brave new world indeed, huh? <laughs> great. You look great. I love your hair. You look amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a topic of discussion. So before we get things going, for, for, for those who don't know, um, Manel, do you mind giving us uh, an introduction about your journey, how, how things started, how surviving a hijab started, how... Uh, Nike came about just you know a timeline please so uh, my name is uh, Manal Rosum um, I'm a very proud Egyptian third culture kid uh, I did not grow up in Egypt I was born and raised in Kuwait actually um, I moved to Egypt when I was 16 years old uh, for uni but then I moved back to Kuwait about nine years later um, and then I moved to Dubai in 2011, so I'm approaching like a, the 10-year mark uh, ve very soon. I studied pharmaceuticals actually, but uh, I've always been an athlete. Uh, I was like, uh, I grew up, you know, um, like I, I, was, I, was, I was learning basically how to swim, how to play tennis, how to run. Um, you know, just, just like a hyper kid running around. Um, I had a very uh, hyper childhood, if you want. Um, Dubai changed a lot of things for me, like, um, you know, Dubai is a city where, you know, if you've got a talent, you will shine. Um, and, and they help you do that. They, they take your hand, you know, to be the best version of yourself, basically. So I would say that my story started in 2014, and I, I've been wearing the hijab since 2001. Not sure if you were born then. Were you born and by 2001? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I don't know, you guys are like kids, you know, but anyway, so I wore the hijab in 2001 um, following a, a fatal accident where I had swapped seats with my cousin and uh, subhanAllah, like five minutes later, um, you know, the front tire blew up, the car went into the desert, uh, my dad got thrown out of the car, my cousin with whom I had swapped seats with uh, broke two bones in his spine. Um, and he uh, passed away uh, three months later, and nothing happened to me. I'm sorry to hear so that. When, when, when these things happen, you know, your, your life sort of, I know it sounds like in the movies, but it, it's, it's really what it's, what it's about. Like, you know, your life flashes before you. Um, you question why, you know, were you picked um, to, to survive or to, to get a second chance in life? And if it's not only a second chance alive, a, ch a second chance injury free if you want. So I decided to wear the hijab when I was uh, 21 years old. And things were going great uh, until I moved to Dubai. And, you know, I started sort of clashing with the, with the cosmopolitan world. You know, yani, مثلاً, while I was a hijabi in Egypt, it was okay. While I was a hijabi in Kuwait, it was okay. Um, but in, in Dubai, I just felt like... Um, I was, I was really sort of uh, standing out in a way that I didn't like very much, you know, especially in the sports scene, you know. And that's where I, I was thinking of removing my hijab, uh, unfortunately, in 2014. And, and I had been wearing the hijab for 13 years. And I said, you know, I went back to my dad and I said, you know, I've been wearing it for 13 years. I feel like it's, um, it's, it's holding me down. You know, it's, I'm not like living my life, you know, to the max. And he's like, what has hijab stopped you from? You're a, you're a scuba diver, you're a runner, you're a mountain mm. climber. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I just don't like it anymore. I'm falling out with it. Yeah, and as, as honest as I can be. And I remember my dad said, if it doesn't make you feel comfortable anymore, then remove it and take it off. And I remember feeling very small at that point. I felt like, yeah, I mean, literally, I always re reference um a dead fish because dead fish go with the flow and if you're still alive you will fight and you will go against the current right and in 2014 there was a phenomena where 
you know, women were being banned, you know, while they were, they, you know, they wear burkinis, they're discriminated against, you know, all around Europe and the States. Yeah. And I was like, okay, let's give this a chance. I'm going to start an online uh, community that I was very, very secretive about because I didn't want people to judge me, you know, because, you know, you know, our communities and you know, our culture, you yeah. know, we create something like this and all of a sudden, Ada Malhadi, uh, She's a terrorist. Oh, my God. I was actually scared of judgment. And I called my community Surviving Hijab. And as selfish as, as it's going to sound, I actually created Sur Surviving Hijab initially for me, you know, to help me put up with the hijab. And the exponential growth that, that you know, I saw was just, you know, insane. Like, we, I, I remember adding 70 girls by hand only to hit 40,000 women within two months. And it's wow. a closed yeah. group, huh? Yeah, and it's not an open fan page where people can just like come in and like it. And that's when I really knew that what I was building right there was much bigger than me and what much bigger than what I was thinking to accomplish. And then I, the story is no longer about me. So at that point I started, I was 34 years old at the time. So that was exactly six years ago. I think actually it was maybe six years ago today, you know, so it's actually quite interesting because it was November uh, 2014. And I remember for the first time in my life, I felt powerful beyond words. Like I felt, you know, I have a voice, I'm empowered to use it and people are encouraged to listen, you know, um, and not just listen, but follow through in my steps. I saw a lot of women from all around the world coming in and they're like, yeah, it was like a me too movement sort of thing. You know, it's like, yeah, like I had the same experience. Um, I'm also always having like a bad hijab day. And <laughs> when I was chatting with a friend of mine and I was like, well, what are we going to do with this? Like, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up to be a leader. You know, you don't sign up to these things. Um, and then he's like, you're an athlete. You know, there's nobody who looks like you in the sports scene um, on an international front. And I was like, okay, well, like, where are you going with this? And he said, why don't you drop an email to Nike? And I was like, what? Like, who am I to drop an email to Nike? And I was like, what am I going to say? He's like, just do it, right? And they're all about just do it. So put it, put an email, you know, tell them who you are, list, you know, your accomplishments. I think at that time I had climbed a couple of mountains. Um, I had done a, one triathlon, um, all this obviously in a hijab. Um, I was an advanced certified scuba diver. Um... You know, so I had left a mark in the sports uh, field, I, f I felt, you know, and then I did. And I, and I wrote an email to uh, Coach Tom Wolf, who was the head of the coaches at the time. And I said, look, this is who I am. This is what I do. There is no Muslim woman representation in the sports field in the world. And, there, and the question is, why not? You know, especially if it's in the Middle East, you know, like there's nobody who looks like me. And I remember receiving an email from uh, Coach Tom the, the following morning. And Bussar, I just felt it was like a dream come true. The fact that somebody dropped an email back to you um, gave me so much hope uh, and faith in, in changing the world, if you want. You know, and it wasn't just about um, somebody being nice. No, he was actually being very understanding and he was like we've actually been having similar conversations in the office uh would you like to meet you know and i met them and a few months later i became um the first hijabi to be featured in a nike middle east campaign and um you know it was just like a miracle after a miracle after a miracle like for me like i was um recruited as their first ever uh nike run club coach come on as a female and as a hijabi for for me personally um, whether I cover or not as a female, you know, to represent Arab women, you know, in that post is, is, is quite huge. And um, in 2015, I was invited as the first Arab to um, visit the headquarters in Portland, Oregon. And all this, Yanni, Yanni, if, you, if you're going to take all this, and I'm, I'm not just telling the story, you know, out of vanity or as a success story. I'm, I'm sharing the story, you know, to help you understand that you can be and nobody, you know, somebody who is like very ordinary. I'm not rich or famous. I wasn't rich or famous. I'm still not rich or famous. I didn't have an Instagram account yet. I was just yes. a girl next door 
who believed in herself and, he, and who believed in her goal strongly enough and was surrounded by the right kind of people to give me the right kind of advice and not belittle my dreams. And I think that's where my story like made a difference. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, that was 2015, 2017. Um, they went off and, um, you know, they, they got inspired and, and they developed the first ever performance um, headwear for Muslim women. And I happened to model it as the face of it in March 2017. Um, I'm the first Arab to be featured on the Nike Run Club app. Not woman, not hijabi, not man or woman. It's just first Arab period. And I, again, this is a huge accomplishment for me that, you know, I work very, very hard to live up to this. Yani, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a huge responsibility, you know, to, to have all these accomplishments and recognition by a global brand. Um, we just launched the Nike Swim. Uh, campaign uh, uh, exactly 14 days ago actually it dropped on my birthday Nike quoted me on their account um, saying that every Muslim woman and every woman deserves the right um, you know to enjoy the magic of the water and um, I, I also happen to play a small part in this film which is again like a dream what a dream and and all this because you know you're giving your voice to a supportive brand that believes in your mission and cause to empower other women because it's not about me. Like surviving hijab is no longer about me. It's about every girl and every woman who is scared to speak up and who's scared to voice her fears and and voice her um, discrimination. You know, like last summer in Egypt, I campaigned for to lift the burkini bands around resorts in mm. in, in Egypt and. Um, Alhamdulillah, we managed to get the government to release multiple uh, announcements to help these women fight for the rights of their ever banned. But the in, 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 um, in, yeah, the multinational brand come out with a burkini, you know, to, to, to send out a message to the world, not just to the Arab world, but these women finally have a proper um, swimwear you know, a.k.a. the burkini, to be able to, to enjoy the water in is, is, is a big deal. As, as, as well as representation, of course, and, and, and I think that's fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's switch gears here a little bit. Um, as you know, our, a lot of our audience are made up of migrants and refugees and people who basically come from Arab and Muslim cultures and um, end up in places where they become a super tiny minority. And uh, for a lot of these people, a social media presence um, could mean a launch of a new career and entrepreneurship opportunities. Uh, what advice do you have for women like that who are hijabi and in countries where they're a tiny minority? Well, first of all, I think this is the time where you need to take advantage of the power of social media. Like, you know, I'm, an, I'm a 70s kid. Like, I was born in 1979. I'm actually 41 years old. And the reason why I mentioned my, my age is because you guys, we didn't grow up with social media. You know, like if I, if I was in love with Madonna, like if Madonna and Michael Jackson were like my favorite, you know, singers, all I had was to go and buy their posters and a smash hits magazine, you know, to be able to look at their photos. I couldn't see what they were doing on a daily basis via their stories on Instagram. I couldn't DM them and just get that, you know, like vibe out of me. So I feel like you have a tool that never, ever, ever um, was never available in, in the history of mankind, you know, and that is the power of, of social media, of, you know, speaking up, of starting online movements, um, of getting a community together without even having met them not once, just because you are so passionate about a cause. And my tip here is if you have a goal, you know, um, make sure that you, it's not about you. Make sure that you involve everyone around you so that it's a community. Because if it's only about you, you're not going to go far. You know, if you're taking a community with you, and if you're taking a tribe, then these people are going to be your people. And that's when change, we start to see change happening. So if I had, you know, contacted Nike or whatever, um, and just said, oh, yeah, like, I just want to be a model. They would have never answered my, my email. But what I was touching base on was the fact that there was a gap, you know, for a whole community that was underrepresented on a global front. 
And I think that's what was very catchy, you know, for big brands. And then shortly after, it's not just Nike, it's like loads of other brands that are following through. And, that, and that's where, you know, we create the change. That you have the power of your voice, the power of your community, and the power of your courage to, to help you power through, to be able to lead that community because it doesn't only stop there. And you need to be very careful because with social media, right now there tends to be a lot of bling bling. And if you're not careful and if it gets to your head, that's it, you're over. You know, so you need to continue to stay grounded and constantly remind yourself of your cause. And deep saraha haga, and I'm really struggling with at the moment. Like the bigger I get, the more recognition, the more attention. It's scary. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's really scary. You know, I get little girls contacting me. Yep. It's, it's, it's such a huge responsibility. Any غلطه بعملها بتبقى ten times the غلطه العادية. Any كلمة غلط بقولها. Any any حركة مش كويسة. Any you know a small act of of um, brutality. If لو أنا حتى مش مش واخدة بالي. If I'm not kind, you know, it's it's gonna be really bad. So it, it's a huge pressure and it's a huge responsibility. And you constantly need to remind yourself of your why. Um, yeah. Um, one thing that you said that kind of struck a chord, uh, Mahajaba Barbie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Uh, it's been uh, a year and a half so far, and we're only in November. Um, how has, you know, um, the pandemic and everything affected how you view being a social media influencer. How, 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 how has your presence kind of been affected? Me survive the pandemic by asking them, what is it that you want me to do? So you want to work out? Yalla. I started um, like a campaign, submit a live on my balacona because I live in a small apartment. So I took to the balacona and I have a bigger space for, in my balcony and we started doing workouts. Um, I think for 34 days straight consecutive workouts where it was, I would go live every day, 5 p.m. You know, I get a little bit of, um, you know, of, of followers who are working out with me. They gave me a reason to, um, I know it's a big word, but they really gave me a reason to exist, if you want, because, you know, I'm an athlete. I was surviving on um, races. I was surviving on mountain climbs. I was surviving on um, talks where I was flying around the world to give these talks, you know, and all of a sudden the pandemic put a hold on all this and put my life on pause, you know, and it wasn't just about my ego um, because I wasn't going to be able to celebrate, you know, myself by doing all these things, but it's also about, this is what I live for. You know, you live for the adrenal adrenaline rush, you know, from a mountain climb, standing on a mountain top representing Egypt, representing my surviving hijab community, representing the brands that I work with. So I feel like social media was, Saraha, yani, it was a life savior for me personally. I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank everybody that was joining me um, throughout, you know, my live uh, Instagram, you know, lives or workouts. And, you know, I, it, they say that when, when something bad happens, um, it either makes you or break you, right? right? So if it makes you because you will have taken the bad and turned it into good, you know? And I feel like I was, yani, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, luckily one of these people who took advantage of the pandemic by turning my house into a gym, you know? And I was doing these stuff, uh, these workouts, by the way, mostly for free until Nike jumped, jumped on board and they sponsored um, some of the workouts, you know? Uh, it, it was it was tough, but social media was a savior. Right. Um, I wanted to know your opinion on something a little bit, maybe perhaps controversial. What do you think about people who are trying tirelessly to become influencers, and all they kind of—I mean—and it's it's a little bit controversial, but but people who basically want to be famous for being famous, you know, like the new. You, <laughs> I wanted to know what you think Look, about that. I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something, okay? Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, and as selfish as it sounds, when I started surviving hijab, by the way, we're 930,000 women from all around the world today. Um, I forgot to tell you that because normally I take you through the numbers, but I started it with 70 women that I added by hand. And then, you know, exponentially, we grew to 40,000 and it's a close community. And then 
Alhamdulillah, today, before I go live, I just uh, checked. It's actually um, 930,000. Um, so it's a, it's a big deal. So, you know, when I first started out, uh, my objective was not to get famous. Uh, my objective was not to get famous. My objective was not uh, to, to, um, to, to cause a movement because I didn't know that I had that capability, to be honest. You know, like I would hear about these people and be like, why are they causing so much trouble? And I would never really get it. You know, like somebody starting a revolution or somebody starting, you know, like what happened like in, in 2011, on it, it was just like social media, how our revolution came about, you know, and it just like sparked a revolution, you know, but, but I feel like you need to understand why you're doing it. Wanting to be famous to be famous. I'm not sure how that could work, you know. Wanting to be famous because you believe in your objective so much and you feel like you will earn that fame once you achieve that goal, then go for it, you know? Anna, for me, again, like I said, as selfish as it sounds, you know, when we first started, that was not the intention. But then I always say when the world doesn't give you the leader that you want, you go off and you become one. And then you need to very quickly adapt to um, teaching yourself how you can be that leader, you know? So I had to learn very quickly how to take criti criticism, how to receive online hate. It's not together for free, you know, fine. You know, I collaborate with big brands. It's, it's a lot of hard work, you know? And like I said earlier, mm. any small mistake it just gets blown out of proportion, you know? Yeah, and appearing with certain characters sometimes on social media, if your particular following, they don't appreciate that particular character or personality, I'm sorry, but you're screwed, you know? Like, um, it happened to me a few times where I just was taking a few people out on a run without needing to mention names. But you know? Uh, and I'm, I'm not talking politics. I'm not discussing uh, any sexual orientation. This is not my job and it's, it's not my field of expertise. You know, I'm just a fitness um, like person. I, I don't really like the word influencer as much as, you know, people will call me an influencer. But if I influence you to do something good, great. You know, if I influence you to go out for a 2K run, 3K run, 5K run and post it on your stories, and motivate your own personal following, then I've influenced you, you know? But in fact, at the time, any person who has 10K followers is an influencer. You know, okay, but you're in the teeny bit. When I entered you on Instagram, I benefited from the content or the content of yours. How has it helped me become a better person? Like, for example, people go to, like, islands in the Maldives. Good morning, everybody um, from the Maldives. Okay. Like, so how are we, like, what, what's the message of the, of the day here? Like, you know, you're just a posh kid, you know, with a lot of money uh, who is able to afford these things. But are you taking me out on a run? Are you going to show me a workout? Um, are you telling me about how you're going to go and visit uh, an orphanage while you're there maybe? Or, you know, or are you going to do like a beach cleanup? You know what I mean? So you need to because, understand the uh, reason why you, you want to become famous. Um, Saraha, it, it's uh, like um, it's good and bad. Like I just feel like you know, it, it sometimes feels great when I'm walking down the street and somebody stops me and they say amazing things. It feels uh, incredibly awesome, and I feel very um, blessed and grateful to have the opportunity, you know, to experience that feeling in my lifetime. It's it's actually quite special, but it's harsh as hell, you know, when people mm. slide in your DMs and say the worst things that you can never imagine. Is, is actually possible to the human mind from someone who's never even seen your face in real life, it becomes really harsh. And unfortunately, you know, you can, you can receive 10 beautiful comments, yet one comment can destroy you for a week. You know, it's, it's like, why did she have to say that? You know? Right. Um, you actually bring up a, 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 a very interesting point for me. Um, being... Uh, online constantly with such a massive presence how, how 
how do you separate your private life from from your the, the life that you present to, to the world? And it just sounds like it's kind of like a new celebrity where people just assume they know everything about you because of how much content you put out there. Look, um, it, you are you have to understand first of all that you are in complete control of what you put out to the world. You know, it's it's just a button. It's just a button that you upload. You can take it down. But unfortunately, like, and I've I've made the mistakes in the past where. I've gone live, for example, on the group, uh, being very, very, very angry. And then I decided to take down the live video after a few hours. But unfortunately, people had screenshotted, people had screen recorded it, and it had to go viral. And I did say wrong things at the time, and I was very angry. But again, um, you just have to understand that um, you are in complete control. I don't lead a very private life because, like, you know, I don't have kids where I don't want to show to the world or... Uh, again, I'm not married. Like I, I try to control it, but I also feel like they deserve to see the inside of your life. Like they deserve to see my my, my parents. Like you know, they they need to see. Um, they need to know if I'm injured and I'm upset, or I'm angry, or I'm sad, or I'm taking two days. You know, as a detox. I feel like you know, for someone to to give you their time, it's it's a very precious thing, and I need to value it. And it's not just because I'm using these followers to collaborate with other brands. No, the followers made me collaborate with the brands. It's not the other way around, you know? So I owe them um, my time. I owe them, um, you know, like free giveaways whenever I can. I, I owe them, you know, to, to be able to be as honest as possible because I hate all the fake stuff that is happening right now. It's misleading. And, and I worry about the younger generation you know, who's not able to differentiate between what's real and what's not. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we, we're, we're kind of running out of time because it's, it's, it's been a full packed day. But before we go, um, just to reiterate, you're talking about young people. And I want to know specifically about young women. What, what, Yanni, and we kind of touched a little bit on this earlier, but what advice would you give young women, especially young women from the Middle East? I'm seeing a lot of people on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and all kinds of social media stuff, but what advice do you as Manal Rustum would give to young women today? And, and I mean young. <laughs> so so I, I believe that every little girl has this inside voice that is speaking to her day in, day out, like every single day, whether it's to become a fashion designer or, um, you, know, uh, you know, an Olympic athlete. There is this inner voice in all of us, and it's not just women, it's actually men too, you know? I just want you to be brave enough to continue to listen to that inside voice and to that inner voice and not let the naysayers, you know, um, drown what that inner voice is telling you because the naysayers are so many and their voices can be a lot more powerful than your little single soft voice inside your heart. And, and that was for me, I, I've always, I've always seen my path. I've always known where I was going, but I was always shut out in terms of what I stood for, how I came off. Like, for example, it's easier for somebody to look at me and be like, she's aggressive and she's very difficult to deal with mm -hmm. than saying, no, she's assertive and she's a strong woman. So we need to note that there are very fine lines between these descriptive, um, you know, like, like nouns, if you want, but, but, but I want these little women to continue to fight. You know, not feel entitled, not feel rude or not come off as rude. You know, powerful is not rude. Um, strong is not aggressive. And th that's my last message for the little girls, because um, I know that they're going to do great, great things. And um, like, I can't wait to see like the next 20 years, what, the, what, what they're going to look like by the, by the younger generation. Um, so, uh, a final question. Do we get some kind of a uh, scoop? On, on, on kind of what's next? I mean, I, mean, I know it's, it's been downtime, but I'm sure there's a lot of stuff in the works, no? So uh, what's next? Okay, look, it's been a crazy year, okay? All my marathons got canceled. Yeah, Ahmed, it's, you don't understand. <laughs> like, this is like my wedding getting canceled twice this year. So I was supposed to be running Tokyo in March, and, and I was, and I was to become balcony. the first Egyptian <laughs> in history you know, to, to run the first six world marathon majors. I know a lot of people make fun of my time because I'm not that fast, 
but I'm not worried about the time. I'm 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 concerned about the the title as first Egyptian. That's what what I'm after. So Tokyo got uh, postponed to October 2021. So inshallah, that's happening uh, when Corona decides to go away. Um, I, I've also signed up for a crazy marathon. It's called the Polar Circle Marathon in uh, in April. Um, I'm also hoping that will go through. I was supposed to run it for my birthday in October 2020. Um, Bardo, it got postponed. Bardo, it got postponed. Marathon? So yeah, so these are the two big marathons that are coming up. And 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 last but not least, I'm actually thinking of moving back to Egypt. But that's that's the final yani thing, you know. But I'm not sure how this is going to roll out. I need a big push to do it. But last time I was in Egypt, I was there actually for my birthday in Guna. And um, yeah, I'm just um, I'm I'm homesick, very homesick. Right. Well, uh, I mean, if you move back here, then maybe we can have you on the actual stage, and uh, without Miss Rona Khalas. <laughs> But uh, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you. Hopefully next year it will be face to face. And thank uh, you, inshallah. Th thank you so much for being here and taking the time. Thank you, thank you, Ahmed. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.